All right, let's go through some terms. Um, I thought I might review a little bit, but of what we just left off about, we're talking about the different forms of doing business, but I think I'll just keep on going. We're up to the point where we need to cover some vocabulary, and some of that vocabulary has to do with a kind of asset, a financial asset versus a real asset. When you think of a real asset, think of the term real estate. Real estate, because real estate has to do with barns and farms and, and wheat fields and all those sorts of things. Very tangible things. Very tangible things. So a real asset is something that you own which is tangible. You can take it into a physics lab. Now, this other kind of asset, which is called a financial asset. That's, that's not something that has weight and mass and it would hurt you if you dropped it on your foot. The, the, the way we can tell a financial asset when we see it, they're all some form of debt. They're all some form of an IOU, some form of a debt. And that's what we call a financial asset. Now let's dive into something we left off talking about last time, and that was the corporate, hey, welcome. Uh, the corporate form, I'm going to mark it here. The corporate form of doing business, the corporate form of doing business, and in a corporation, we said that the corporation is owned by its stockholders it's stockholders with a proprietorship you are it it is you with a partnership we are it it is us but with a corporation we now have a separate individual artificial person by law we have a artificial legal person that can do everything that other persons including human being persons can do Now, with that entity, when that entity wants to borrow, and like a person that can borrow, float a bond, whatever, it would give, say, you've got $10,000 and you'd like a good return on it, and they need $10,000, well, they could write up an IOU, IOU $10,000, and they'll pay you 10% interest for the next seven years, and you say, okay, here's the $10,000. Uh, I take this piece of paper, and you better be paying me every year, the 10% every year, and at the end of that time period, I want all my money back. Is that a deal? That's a deal. And accountants would call that financing by debt. That debt sort of thing. Now, there's another way the corporation get money. They can sell off shares of the corporation. And they call that equity. Now, those are accounting distinctions. But I want to make the point in our economics class that both a stock certificate and a bond are both a financial asset. Since we're not in an accounting class, I'm saying they're both a form of IOU. Well, it's obvious how a bond is an IOU. You gave them the money, they gave you a piece of paper, it's a promise to pay you back with interest. That's obviously a debt, obviously financial. Obvious I IOU, but how is a stock, how is a stock an IOU? Well, let's say you own 50% of a company, so that you, you own 50, let's say 100, 100 shares in the company, you own 50 of those 100 shares, and you decide to take a tour one day, and you go to the corporation, and you go up to the guard of the corporation and say, hi, um, I'm 50% owner, here's, here's my stock certificates, and... Um, I, I would like to take about, let's say I'll, I'll draw a line. How big is it? It's about this big. I'm going to draw a line right down there, and I'm going to take all of those things, and I'm going to hand you my stock certificates, and I'm going to take all that portion of the company. Does that work? Does that work? No. <laughs> no, no, no. You, yeah, you own the shares, all right, but you don't own that. Oh, that's, you don't own it. What does that stock certificate say? It says that, if and when the company makes profits, the company might decide to declare dividends. And if it declares 
dividends, it promises to pay you 50% of all dividends because you own 50% of the stock. So I am arguing that in an economics class, rather than debt versus equity financing, even the shares of stock itself is a form of an IOU, not a form of an ownership. The test of ownership is if you can't disown it, you don't own it. So what do you own with a stock certificate? You own whatever proportionate share of the dividends that that company distributes. You are owed that. That's what is owed to you. It's not in the text, but I thought since we're talking about macroeconomic wealth and individual wealth, we probably should define it. So let me just give you a definition that I, I don't have in the book but it's my definition of wealth, and so I think I'll just lay it out there so you can get it in your notes. Because if we're talking about wealth, we should probably define what we're talking about. The definition I'll give you of wealth is the quality and quantity of your economic options. For our purposes, the definition of wealth is the quality and the quantity of your economic options. Now notice, I didn't necessarily say anything about money. Not necessarily. Because economic wealth can include money, obviously, but it can be greater than money. For instance, is good health, would you say, is good health a form of economic wealth? Yeah, I know a lot of people will spend a lot of money to regain their health or to even increase their health, right? Um, are family relationships a form of economic wealth? I think so. I know of one person that I worked with um, Quite a few years ago, he made a lot of money, uh, and he was one of those fellows that really liked to work. He really lived to work. He didn't work to live. He lived for his work, and he made money at it. He was good at it, uh, but he spent a lot of money during the time I knew him giving it to shrinks, giving it to psychologists. And he was paying a lot of money to have his kids go to psychologists, and his ultimate goal since he didn't spend any time with his kids when they were growing up and they weren't really part of his agenda, he was just trying to hope some way that he could help the kids understand him better so that they would kind of like him. <laughs> he just wanted to have a relationship with his kids and he didn't build it when they were growing up and they didn't think very highly of him and so if he paid them to go to a psychologist, maybe they might think better. He was willing to spend money to rebuild a relationship with his children that he didn't have when they were growing up. So is family relationships a form of wealth? Yeah, it is. How about your good name or your reputation for honesty? Does that increase your economic options? Then I'm saying it is a form of wealth. So I, I don't want us to have this blinders on about when we're talking about wealth. We're only talking about dollars in a bank account or how many stock options we have or something like that. Wealth is the quality and quantity of your economic options. Our text talks about something called consumer sovereignty. Consumer sovereignty. Sovereignty. Now, sovereignty, again, we're talking about this... Uh, um, suzerainty lord thing that we talked about earlier uh, and when we were reviewing it today. We're talking about who's the king, who's the sovereign, who's in charge, who's calling the shots. And our text uses this term of consu consumer sovereignty and says that, well, households really control the civil government and control the economy through their dollar votes. If we spend a lot of money at 
Burger King and we don't spend any money at McDonald's, well then Burger King's going to thrive and McDonald's is going to just go away. Why? Because with our dollars we voted that I like this kind of sandwich and I don't like that kind of sandwich. So who rules in the economy? Well, it's the people who spend their dollars. And however we spend our dollars, that's going to determine the winners and the losers. And if some particular restaurant is losing, they got to stand back and say, ooh, we're not doing something right. I wonder what they're doing right. I think we're going to try a different tact and see if we can win some of those dollars back and do what these consumers want so we can get their dollar votes and make a profit and live a happier lifestyle. And the text goes on to say that the households, the households really are in control of the government through their vote and their dollar vote. Their dollar vote in the economy, in the marketplace, but their political vote. Now I want to counter that. I, I, I want to question that. I'm not going to say the book's wrong. I'm just going to question that. There is a, as I'm making this video, there's a TV show. You might have seen it. It's a science fiction TV show called Continuum. Anybody know, know what I'm talking about? I don't, I don't have a TV, but I see reruns every now and then. Um, anyway, you know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about. Okay, well, there is this TV show Continuum. I know because I've seen some episodes of it. But these script writers write this science fiction television show about how a culture becomes more and more corporatist and the corporations take over and obsolete the civil government as we know it. And so the, the, the plot is we the people against the corporations and there's, I'm sure they picked it up because there's a subcurrent of that. There, there are people who are saying, wow, the, the corporations have a lot of power. Now, using that as an illustration of contemporary thinking, enough that there would be a TV show about that, who controls, from a legal sense, who controls the game of the macroeconomy in terms of its governance. Do the households control it with their votes of the lex politician? Or could it be that this consumer sovereignty, this dollar vote, comes from the biggest economic powerhouse in terms of institutions in our society? And that huge institution is not the family, it's not the nonprofit, it tends to be the ever-growing and increasingly dense, one popular term is the one percenters in the news. People are talking about those evil one percenters and we're the 99 percenters, where this sovereignty, which at least in theory, the government is supposed to be the dog and the business corporations are supposed to be the tail, that the dog wags. But what if this tail starts wagging the dog? What if the corporations, through their influence and power now, have more influence over corporation, over the government, than do the citizens and the households? And there's more and more a question that is being debated. I don't see any trend of it reversing itself. I see the trend continuing, and that's probably why TV shows like Continuum kind of have a draw to them, because they're science fiction about could society be going in that particular direction. We're going to close there and begin our next section with what I call the four socioeconomic isms.